very glad and uh, very honored to be here tonight. Uh, and I'm not here to talk about Donald Trump. Although it seems that, you know, these days, even when you're not talking about Donald Trump, you are talking about Donald Trump, so maybe this will come back in the discussion. Uh, I'm here to speak about the American left uh, and American intellectuals on the left. So the US has always had a lot of problems with the left and a lot of problems with intellectuals. Uh, and I'll try to map out uh, some of the new initiatives that have recently come up, let's say, in the past 10 years uh, on the American left. Um, focusing on new magazines, little magazines, that have mushroomed um, over the past decade. Um, the radical activist and songwriter Joe Hill um, famously said, don't mourn, organize, when he was sentenced to death. Uh, and this is, in many ways, how the left reacted to the election of uh, Donald Trump. Uh, the magazine Jacobin, uh, whose website you see here, uh, wrote in the aftermath of the election an editorial uh, in which they declared, and I quote, this is a new era that requires a new type of politics, one that speaks to people's pressing needs and hopes rather than to their fears. Elite liberalism, it turns out, cannot defeat right-wing populism. We can't move to Canada or hide under the bed. This is a moment to embrace democratic <coughs> politics, not repudiate them. Um, so since its creation in 2010, Jacobin, with others, has attempted to give a voice to this new type of politics, uh, supporting movements like Occupy Wall Street and the candidacy of Bernie Sanders uh, to the Democratic primary. Uh, and they have tried to map out what a socialist agenda for the United States would be, uh, without forfeiting all appeals to more mainstream media and uh, politicians. So, historically, uh, the American left has had very little political importance, if you think in terms of party, in terms of elections, and to be clear, by left here, I mean outside of the Democratic Party, um, what is um, commonly called a radicalism, or radicals uh, in the US. Uh, but the American left has had um, a very important impact, socially and culturally, um, just to quote, very famous examples in the 19th century, um, abolitionists advocated the eradication of slavery uh, long before uh, Lincoln uh, started to think about it. Uh, first wave feminists advocated free love, the right to divorce, and the right to vote in the 19th century. Um, socialists at the end of the 19th century campaigned for the eight hour week uh, and many more social advancements. Um, and culturally, uh, they have bequeathed to American culture uh, a wealth of protest songs, uh, books, uh, works of art in various fields. Uh, if you think about the Great Depression, if you think about the 60s and 70s, what we remember from that, uh, for a lot of us, are the cultural products that emerged from these years. Uh, so we're not there yet today. Uh, there's no mass movement, whether social or cultural, uh, but I would like to point out those little things uh, that have been happening and that might give us um, some hope and also some tools uh, from the point of view of Europe where um, cultural produc production, intellectual production on the left is also uh, undergoing uh, a crisis. So little magazines in the US have a long history dating back to the modernist magazines of the early 20th century, uh, which were, for most of them, geared towards uh, the arts, uh, but which were not all apolitical. Um, a magazine like The Little Review uh, was, in its first years, close to uh, anarchist Emma Goldman. So why speak about these publications, which almost by definition are marginal? Um, and could seem superfluous in the current context of American politics. Because little magazines' influence often goes widely beyond the circle of their readers, uh, and because their role as an avant-garde can sometimes, and I stress here the sometimes, make them heralds of the mainstream of tomorrow, which is something that we might hope for. Uh, so without a doubt, the golden age of little magazines is the early 20th century. Today, with the changes in reading habits, the, digi the digital revolution, 
Uh, some actually wonder whether magazines, journal, uh, journals, what we call in French les revues, uh, have any point at all as a format. Um, however, in the US, over the past decade, there has emerged a whole new generation of these uh, magazines to the left of the Democratic Party. Um, magazines like N Plus One, Jacobin, Viewpoint, New Inquiry, Roar, and uh, Dissent, which is an old magazine that was founded in the 1950s but uh, has known of, um, has changed its editorial team. Um, all those magazines lie on the margins both of parties, mainstream media, and academia. Um, and they tend to see themselves as the intellectual pendant of social or artistic movements rather than as uh, linked with parties or with uh, academics. So with the rising distrust against mainstream media, um, the stultification of political communication and the relative isolation of academic life, the question is what do their voices bring to the public debate and how have they come to be? So in political strategy, you often explain the success of a movement by the conjunction of three factors, man, moment, and message. If you have those three things, um, you have a successful leader or a political movement. Uh, I'd like to map out uh, the landscape of those magazines following those same three Ms, uh, although I will be replacing man by milieu. Um, so to see how they have emerged from what social movements, from what protests, and what they are trying to do. Uh, also adding maybe a fourth M, which would be the means which with, uh, with which they operate, because those magazines are almost by definition fragile, precarious, and um, one doesn't know whether they will be long-lasting or not. So to introduce the context in which those magazines were created, I'd like to talk about um, a moment in the sense that the French philosopher Frédéric Vos uh, speaks about moments in philosophical history to define not only an event but all the things that go with it before and after the criticism, the analysis, etc. etc. From this point of view, I think that we can speak about an Occupy Wall Street moment uh, that would encompass things that happened before Occupy. Okay, obviously the financial crisis, uh, but also the anti-globalization movements of the 1990s. Uh, also books like Naomi Klein, Klein's Shock Doctrine, for instance, uh, and things that came after, uh, for instance, Bernie Sanders' uh, primary uh, campaign. All those things, uh, I believe, encompass an OWS moment that is not limited to the actual occupation of Zuccotti Park, from September to November 2011. And the dates of birth of these magazines kind of map out this moment. Uh, N plus one, which is uh, a literary and cultural magazine, um, was born in 2004. Um, the New Inquiry, which is a cross-disciplinary magazine linking art, literature, science, and politics uh, in 2009. Roar, which is reflections on a revolution, uh, more geared towards global social movements, and Jacobin, uh, which is a more socialist Marxist-oriented magazine, were born in 2010, and Viewpoint, uh, which is a magazine of Marxist theory, was born of, from Occupy Wall Street in 2011. What's interesting is that the period from 2004 to 2011 also witnessed a revolution <laughs> in journalism and the dissemination of information through obviously the creation and rise of Facebook, but also uh, the creation of news applications by Google and Apple. So this moment has to be situated in a wider context. Uh, in 2001, the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center created a national unity among parties of government, which led to the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq, and which started to crumble as the war in Iraq became a quagmire and revelations accumulated on the lies that had given birth to it. Um, so at the time, Michael Walzer, who was the editor of Dissent, uh, so Dissent is a social democrat magazine which was founded in the 1950s, opposed both to Soviet communism and American capitalism, 
uh, Michael Walter was opposed to the war in Iraq and brought to his opposition his philosophical reflection on uh, just and unjust wars. Um, more than the terrorist attacks, however, what sparked the creation of these magazines was the economic crisis of 2007-2011 and the global protest movements of 2010-2011, the Arab Springs and the Indignados and obviously Occupy Wall Street. The growing precariousness of the job market was also in the US and elsewhere, especially felt in academia and specifically for students and researchers in the humanities. Um, they found themselves to be the first victims of the growing weight of neoliberal management in universities um, all over the country. So more and more of them today cannot hope for an academic career. Tenure to many is unattainable. And they try to find other job opportunities, whether in publishing, journalism, or the cultural industries. And we'll see that that also leads to uh, the creation of those magazines. So just for the sake of argument, let us isolate the movements that led to this renaissance of little magazines. Um, the events um, that sparked those creations were uh, global, watched and commented on all over the world, thanks in part to new technologies. Um, and some little magazines were born with the avowed aim of breaking the isolation of the American left. And some of them felt that for too long the American left had been basically trapped in criticizing George W. Bush and the Patriot Act, etc., etc., which was all very uh, nice and, um, and good, but uh, separated them from more global movements that were going on. This is especially the case for um, Roar, um, which was um, directly born from uh, these global movements. Uh, it was created by Jerome Roos, and it became noticed when during the Arab Springs, it revealed the links that existed between the London School of Economics and the Gaddafi regime in Libya. Uh, the magazine was then instrumental in publicizing the methods of the 15M movement in Spain, of the Indignados, in the United States. And therefore, Rohr directly contributed to the tactics of Occupy Wall Street by making uh, the mobilization of the indignados known in the US and by making the tactics of mobilization. <coughs> Wealth inequality was also obviously a, a theme common to those global movements as well as to the magazines that emerged in their midst. Publications like Jacobin and Viewpoint thus tried to give new relevance to a Marxist analysis of the crisis uh, of the insecurity of the job market, the hoarding of profit by a small minority. Um, and this goes with the comeback of economic issues on the American political scene. Um, to be very brief, um, during the 1990s, those economic and social issues had been replaced with what is called cultural issues, meaning things like religion, abortion, gun rights, etc., etc. Uh, in the year 2000s, and especially after the economic and financial crisis, the issues of wealth inequality came to the fore of uh, the political debate. Um, it's not so anecdotal that a book uh, like Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century, when it was published in France, it, it did have an echo, but it didn't have a huge echo. Why? Because speaking about inequality in France is something that everyone says, yeah, nah, yeah, we know. Uh, when it was translated into English and published in the United States, uh, it was hugely successful in the US. Why? Because, in a way, it gave a voice to something that hadn't been articulated for a long time in the United States, although levels of inequality um, had reached the levels of the pre-depression period of the 1930s. Um, this is also linked to several social movements that happened in the United States, um, the public union's protests in Wisconsin against Governor Scott Walker, the unionization movements of graduate students in universities, especially on the East Coast, and um, more important, well, not more importantly, but it's been more important, uh, the fight for $15, uh, which is a widespread movement advocating rising, raising the minimum wage to $15 an hour 
and also the right to unionization, especially in trades and um, professions like uh, service profession, the fast food industries, where workers are um, very fragile and very difficult to organize because they're often part-time, they often have several jobs, etc., etc. So the fight for $15 managed, to a certain extent, uh, to mobilize those workers. One can't forget, obviously, the generational dimension of uh, the 2010-2011 movement, often led by young college graduates, whether in the Arab countries, in Spain, in Greece, or in the US, who couldn't find work uh, in their own countries, had to find it abroad, or had to find work that did not correspond to their qualifications. So the rejuvenation of older magazines like Descent and the creation of new ones owes much, actually, to the transformation of the job market, especially concerning the field of the humanities. So in 2011, um, the publishing house Verso published a book called Occupy, Scenes from Occupied America. The book is a collection of texts from the Occupy Gazette, um, narratives of personal experiences, pictures of OWS slogans, and billboards. And it was edited by people who worked at Descent, N Plus One, The New Inquiry, those little magazines which had been blooming. Um, so this collaboration around an event that had profoundly impacted all those magazines shows that beyond their sometimes important differences, uh, they come from the same milieu, uh, which works through cross-reading, cross-publishing, exchanging writers and ideas in order to create a nebula of intellectual work aimed at giving a voice to the American left. Um, and why is this new? I mean, I don't know whether it's new or not, uh, but it's true that for the past decades after the social upheavals of the 60s and 70s, um, US American radicalism had seemed to retreat from the streets to the campuses. One speaks of campus radicalism. Um, the growing importance of academic journals, uh, the development of studies on race and gender, led in the eyes of some to the marginalization of social and political criticism, which had become shrouded in the veil of theory, with a capital T. Um, protest was postmodern, aired in lecture halls and research seminars, disconnected from social movements. The few comprehensive magazines which existed, like Descent, were headed by academics. Um, so this criticism is the one waged by the younger generation of editors. Um, just to quote Seth Ackerman, one of the founders of, Jake, of Jacobin, he, in an interview, described an American left that was over-specialized and out of touch with issues linked to exploitation, alienation, and discrimination. So most of this, these magazines define themselves as being on the left, meaning outside the Democratic Party. Uh, their orientations are diverse. Um, some are more geared towards social movements, like Roar. Uh, others are more geared towards uh, Marxist theory. Others towards culture, uh, like N plus uh, One. But they don't refuse all relationship with the mainstream. And that's interesting if you compare them with radical publications of the early 20th century or of the 60s and 70s. Here, uh, they're glad to have their names in the New York Times or the Washington Post. Um, so partly because, as I said, their precarious situation um, results in the fact that they have to write for those publications in order to earn money. Um, partly also because they deliberately want to influence the, the mainstream. Uh, David Marcus says, we want our ideas to trickle up. Okay, so basically to get to uh, the mainstream. And this is something, in a way, that the candidacy of Bernie Sanders did reveal. Uh, how social movements and intellectual movements could permeate the Democratic Party, even though, of course, Sanders was an independent, but he chose to run, to run within the Democratic Party, uh, thus ideally changing uh, what the Democratic Party puts forward in its platform. Didn't really work, uh, but you know there was hope there. Um, so the magazines I'm talking about today don't claim to be radically new. Uh, although they share the ambition of renewing intellectual thought on the left. Um, they aim to do so either by 
rehabilitating prisms of interpretation uh, which have gone out of fashion, like Marxism, for instance, or by linking fields of inquiry and political action which have been separated for too long. Feminism, anti-racism, environmentalism, etc., etc. So I would just like to briefly indicate uh, their influence, how they work, uh, to see if that resonates beyond the borders of the US. So the magazines I'm talking about make reference to the two main periods in US history in which the left was influential. The 1930s, uh, what is called the old left, and the 1960s and 70s, commonly called the new left. Uh, the founders of N plus one make explicit references to the Partisan Review, uh, which was a major literary and cultural magazine founded in the 1930s, uh, publishing avant-garde literature and criticism. Um, so the founders of N plus one say, you know, we're like Partisan Review, except not dead yet. Um, and um, the Jacobin, in its second issue, published a text entitled letter to the next left. Um, this was a direct answer to a text that American sociologist C. Wright Mills had written uh, in the 1960s called Letter to the New Left. Uh, in this text, Mills said that in order to um, find a new audience, you know, in order to um, gain some new ground, uh, the left needed to abandon what he called labor metaphysics. Uh, in, order, in other words, he said that the unions at the time, in 1960, had become complicit with capitalism and that the left could not rest exclusively on the working class. What Mill said was that the left had to open it, itself up to the world and to find in intellectuals the avant-garde that would propel it forward. Uh, so Chris Maizano, who wrote Letter to the Next Left in Jacobin, said not the contrary, but yes, kind of the contrary. What he says is basically, the problem of the left is that it has forgotten the working class. Okay, and so that intellectuals have proven by their isolation in academia that they cannot be the force to propel this social change forward. Uh, what Maizano says, however, is not simply, you know, come back to a kind of classic Marxist vision of the working class. He says, today, a lot of people who are not blue-collar workers can be considered as working class. And a lot of people <laughs> in the intellectual professions uh, who have a cultural capital that would not put them in the traditional definition of the working class now belong to it because of their economic conditions, because of the way they work, because of the precariousness of their jobs. Um, so in other words, try to build bridges between the workers in various fields and the new intellectual proletariat. Um, so just in order to give you a broad idea of the preoccupations of these magazines, I'll quickly show you their latest issues um, and, and what they deal with. Uh, so for Jacobin, which is quite timely because the issue came out uh, last week, it's the party we need, the new issue, which is basically a blueprint to create uh, a party on the left of the Democratic Party, but it also includes texts about what we can learn from the Bernie Sanders campaign um, and a history of the Socialist Party of America. So one of the aims of Jacobin is not only to propose new ideas for the political left, but also to uh, to work with a usable past to show that there has been a socialist movement in the United States of America and to show its successes and its failures. Um, Rohr uh, has an issue, so all of them obviously, I'll come back to this, uh, published online content dealing, content dealing with the election of Donald Trump, uh, but the most recent issue is Uh, is about the rule of finance. So with, uh, once again, we see the uh, enduring influence of Occupy Wall Street, the financial aristocracy, uh, the global 1% under siege, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, Dissent has an issue on feminist strategies. And um, N plus one has an issue entitled Dirty Work, 
which includes articles on unions, political campaigning, as well as uh, short stories. Um, one element that is striking about these magazines is the relationship that they establish between form and content. Um, so little magazines, of course, when they were geared towards cultural and uh, aesthetic issues, had very, paid very close attention to their format, to how they presented their texts. It was less true for left or leftist magazines, which tended to be you know, uh, very hastily printed out and in the later years of photocopies to be handed out, but with no specific reflection as to how the content should be presented. Uh, these new magazines are very much attentive to the form that they present themselves through. Um, and they see their uh, magazines are as uh, objects which should be both informative and transformative in terms of content as well as form or format. Um, the founders of Jacobin deliberately stressed the importance of design uh, for, their, uh, for their magazine. Um, and you know, the founder basically said, the only paid person in our staff is the designer, uh, because we want to produce something that is uh, nice, that is beautiful, uh, and that is both on paper and online. And that's another um, interesting uh, point that almost all of these magazines, some of them like Viewpoint are only online, but most of them are both paper and online. Um, to the extent that, so N plus one initially was only a paper magazine, uh, and then uh, later on started to publish native content on its website. Interestingly enough, interestingly enough the new inquiry did the reverse. Uh, initially, the new inquiry was only a website, and since 2015, it has started publishing uh, a paper magazine. So. What this trend shows is that contrary to what seems to be the orientation of newspapers, for magazines, the internet and paper are not antagonistic formats. They complement each other. Um, so in order to survive, the paper, yes, must be a beautiful object that one likes to own. Um, and this diversity is also apparent in the style of text that they publish. Uh, Jacobin is more geared towards social and political analysis, but always has a portfolio of photographs in their paper issue. Uh, N plus one, from the start, aimed at mixing fiction and nonfiction, providing both analyses and uh, also short stories and poems. Dissent, uh, which historically is mostly a critical magazine, has also started to publish fiction. So this idea of crossing uh, genres, uh, generic borders, is also very important uh, to those magazines. So a moment, Amelia, a message. Uh, these are the various factors that enable little magazines on the left today to resonate beyond the number of their readers. Uh, Jacobin is probably the most popular, um, and it has a circulation of uh, 25,000 for its paper magazine, which is not much uh, related to the size of the US. However, its website uh, receive um, 300 to 400,000 visits a month, which is not negligible. Um, the candidacy of Bernie Sanders to the Democratic primary illustrated this building up of the left in the US, which has occurred over the past decade, thanks to the development of social movements like OWS, the fight for $15, uh, movements against police violence like Black Lives Matter. Um, and from which many of these magazines, directly or indirectly, were born. <coughs> However, there remains the issue of means. Such publications are almost by definition fragile. Um, culture, uh, intellectual life in the US is not funded or is not directly funded by the government. Uh, so the magazines depend on subscriptions, uh, fundraising, donors, etc., etc. And uh, as I said, when you are an academic and you edit uh, a journal, well, you have your salary as an academic, so you don't necessarily need to be paid in order to edit your magazine. When you are a freelance writer, you need to find money somewhere. Okay? So you have to write for other publications, you have to find 
other ways to earn money because it's certainly not publishing a little magazine uh, that will enable you to, um, to live from it. Um, so, of course, these magazines, in spite of uh, sometimes the goals that they have in common, can fall prey to <coughs> infighting, so frequent on the left, and which is also caused by the relatively small milieu, uh, academic and intellectual, that they come from. Uh, they're also, let's be realistic, uh, quite geographically isolated, uh, mainly in New York, Chicago, or other big cities. But what is interesting when you read those magazines, and even in the aftermath of the victory of Donald Trump, is that you perceive a form of dynamism, a pleasure in the act of writing, thinking, mobilizing, that, I mean, at least that coming from France, uh, resonates in a place where the left, even the radical left, seems to be more characterized by depression uh, than by motivation. So it's, it's interesting to have a look. Um, we often tend to think that the American left either does not exist uh, or definitely cannot be a model for what we can do in Europe because we have a much older, more structured tradition of what the left is. I think it is interesting to look at what's happening in the US, even if it's embryonic, even if it's sometimes unsatisfactory, uh, if only because of the kind of, and I'm saying this realizing the irony, seeing the moment that we are in, but the kind of relative enthusiasm that um, infuses in the pages of uh, those magazines. Uh, and it is important, this relative optimism is invaluable. And it is also necessary to the pursuit of projects which very often survive only through the sheer motivation of those who carry them out. And um, I think that is a fitting way to conclude my talk, for which I thank you very much. Thank you, Alice. Uh, uh, if you have questions, uh, it's time to ask them. Uh, while you're thinking of questions, I have one. And um, uh, you mentioned that um, I mean American uh, intellectual scene is uh, really notorious for its isolationism, and um, uh, also the the uh, cultural and and uh, and uh, journal scene historically have been quite isolated from the rest of the world. Uh, so you mentioned now a uh, few uh, connections uh, with the magazines that, uh, and their willingness to open up. Maybe you can uh, tell us a bit more on the... Because we have experienced uh, quite a few changes uh, since 2008, 2007 in Europe, Africa and Middle East. And uh, how did they... I know that Jacobin, for example, was covering very... Um, in detail, the crisis in Greece and uh, the the situation in, in Spain. But how do they actually perceive the rest of the world outside of the USA? Um, it's an interesting question. They they definitely have a global perspective in the sense that, as you said, uh, they do report regularly on what's happening in Europe and uh, all over the world. That's especially true for uh, Roar. Uh, Roar was deliberately founded on this idea that they are, there are emerging global movements and that one needs to take them into account, and to translate them uh, to uh, America. And as I said, that was particularly uh, instrumental for Roar in the case of uh, the Indignados movement, uh, which they publicized and which uh, indirectly not led to Occupy, but at least nourished the activists of, uh, of Occupy. The links that exist, um, at least for uh, Jacobin, uh, are also very much through the networks of the radical left, uh, both in the US and you know, in, in France, for instance, uh, the far left um, parties and uh, activists and intellectuals have links with, uh, with Jacobin. Um, however, it is true that in terms of, um, how can I put this? For those of them who are the most political, uh, international outlooks nourishes their perspective. However, their first goal, and I think it's understandable given the circumstances and given what they were born from, is to reinvent the American left, 
So above all, to give tools to uh, American activists, social activists, intellectuals, etc., etc., to uh, think beyond the current um, political schemes uh, and to imagine something more radical. Uh, but above all, it is geared towards an American audience, an American politicized uh, audience, which tries to find alternatives to the Democratic Party, basically. Um, and Jacobin, at least, does that through um, an outlook that can sometimes be a little bit dogmatic and ideological and very Marxist. And it, it's interesting because when, from the point of view of um, a French woman, uh, it sometimes seems like they're rediscovering things that are very mainstream, at least in leftist circles um, in, in Europe. Uh, at least, I mean, I speak for France, but um, I gather it, it's the same thing in, in other countries. And it, you know, in France, it's rather the contrary. It's like, OK, Marx, yes, we've, we've done that. Uh, it's fine, but now let's find something else. And they're coming back to that, also because, as Ackerman says, it's true that there is a lack of continuity in the transmission of the legacy of the, of the American left. Okay, the new left didn't want to have anything to do with the old left, so it's basically scrapped that and threw it in the bin. Uh, and there has been little continuity between the new left and what is happening now, which to be honest, I wouldn't qualify yet because I don't know if it's anything yet. Um, but there is also that dimension of making a legacy available, saying you get the impression that the left has never existed in America, uh, it has, and let us tell it you how. Uh, and for instance, Viewpoint, which is the more theoretical uh, of those magazines, uh, regularly publishes in its issues not only um, uh, unpublished articles, but also historical texts. Uh, for instance, I don't know, on the exploitation of black women in the 30s, etc., etc., to make that legacy available not only to scholars and specialists of labor history to evaluate what kind of audience it really reaches is difficult. As I said, Jacobin is the most uh, wide-ranging of them all so far. Endless One uh, is more um, New York intellectual artistic uh, scene. Thank you. Vitania. Yeah. More sure. I can hear you. Sorry, good to see you. <laughs> questions. Yeah. One is, um, uh, what is the relation, or how they refer these all uh, magazines, or uh, I call it social movement in the USA, or historically existing populism in the USA? In a populist party of the United States of America that existed in the southern part of the country during the beginning of the 20th century. And the second question is, uh, already existing small political parties as democratic socialists of USA and the Working Families Party. What is their 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 position in this broader social in this broader momentum as you as you mentioned? Yeah. Um, so as far as the populist party is concerned, um, it is it's definitely I mean it's a party that's been more successful than the Socialist Party in sheer terms of you know the number of people that it got elected and the success that it had in elections. Um, so it is part of the legacy of the American left. However, so here I'm speaking mostly about Jacobin, first of all, because it's, to be honest, one of the ones that I've read the most. Uh, also because it's the one that's most concerned uh, with this question of the legacy of socialism in America. Um, so Jacobin has written about uh, left-wing populism as opposed to uh, to right-wing populism, claiming it as part of it, this inheritance, and also working the whole problem, and this relates to uh, what you said about the Working Families Party, um, the whole issue that's raised in the latest issue of Jacobin about the party we need is the um, <coughs> enduring problem of third parties in the USA. So that basically it's very difficult to exist as a third party in the electoral system uh, of the United States of America, and that if you do exist as such a party, uh, you are always going to have people tell you that you are taking votes away from the Democrats and therefore poten potentially favoring Republicans. Um, the Working Families Party has had <clears throat> a strategy, so that's pretty specific, uh, that is that of fusion voting. Um, so 
Basically, in the state of New York, it's one of the very few states where this is authorized, you can have fusion voting. What does it mean? It means that if you are a third party, you can present, um, you can be on the ballot as a third party, but you can put the name of um, a, a Democratic candidate, for instance, on your ballot, which means that the people who support you are going to vote for the Democratic candidate, but the Democratic Party will know that those votes came from the Working Families Party. Um, so Jacobin has criticized that, saying that basically it drowns out the specificities of the Working Families Party, to which Jacobin has ties, and they've been uh, writing about them. Um, so the issue is not solved. Uh, the question, according to Jacobin, the best way would be to, yes, to create a party, uh, but not to systematically um, run for elections because it's a very complex process for a third party to have access to the ballot in the US. I won't go into the details, but it's much, much more complicated than, I don't know about Croatia, but than in most European countries in terms of the number of signatures that you have to have. So basically, if you're a third party and you want to run for elections, you're going to spend all your capital, all your time, all your resources ensuring just that you are on the ballot and you don't have time for campaigning and you don't have money uh, to raise awareness, to go see the people. Uh, so what Jacobin says is basically, yes, we need a party because we need a structure, um, but we need to focus on the link with social movements, on getting an audience, uh, and uh, rather than systematically wanting to have candidates in elections. And incidentally, I find that also interesting, so once again, it's a very small minority, um, but that, that a movement on the left should express this need for a party uh, because, once again, at least in France, the party form is considered to be rather outdated and problematic in many ways, and people on the left are often rather trying to organize around associations, citizens groups, etc., etc., uh, believing that the form of the party is no longer uh, the best way to advance uh, new ideas for social change. Um, in the US, at least for this very small, once again, uh, minority of people, uh, the party forum still seems to be the best way uh, to structure an organized movement. I don't know whether I've answered or completely evaded your question. <laughs> Please feel free to ask you know, more general questions or if you want to talk about Trump, I can bring myself <laughs> to that. Maybe you can talk about the Bernie Sanders. Yeah. Interesting point. Um, the issue now for people on the left is what's going to happen, obviously. Uh, the candidacy of Sanders was interesting in very many ways. First of all, because it's true that few people saw it coming. Few people could have predicted that you know, an old, an old white senator from Vermont would um, spread enthusiasm in crowds of young people. Uh, that you know was more expected of Barack Obama in 2008, uh, less expected of Bernie Sanders. Uh, the other issue, as I said, is the fact that you know when Occupy Wall Street happened, uh, everyone was saying, "Well, this is leading to nothing. Uh, they don't know what they want. They don't have specific claims, etc., cetera, etc." Cetera. So I'm not saying that the Bernie Sanders candidacy sprung from OWS, uh, but it's a process. You have social movements that build throughout the country. You have issues like wealth inequality, like uh, uh, college debt, that come to the fore of the political debate because of those social movements, because of the relay through the media, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying that it necessarily translates into a candidacy in a mainstream party, but, you know, uh, it does lead to a change in what's being talked about. And the topic of this election was, and for Trump as well, the issues of economic wealth inequality, um, unemployment to a lesser degree, uh, college tuition. So that's interesting. The other interesting thing but that is also specific to the American electoral system is the fact that Sanders chose to run within the Democratic Party. What that entailed, because he played by the rules, was that when he lost, he supported Hillary Clinton's candidacy. 
Uh, some of uh, his supporters said, you know, you should go and make a ticket with Jill Stein, uh, the Green candidate. And Sanders, to me, quite consistently said no, because he ran as a Democrat and therefore he played by the rules of the Democratic Party, which are that if you lose a primary, you support the candidate who won. Um, the question is what happens now? Um, Sanders has launched a kind of well, I don't know whether to call it a movement, but called Our Revolution, which aims to pursue the kind of dynamic that he has raised. Uh, so far, it hasn't sparked the same enthusiasm that uh, his, candidacy, his candidacy had. Uh, to me, the question is that, I mean, to me, not only to me, <laughs> of the evolution of the Democratic Party. That is, will this crushing defeat uh, lead the Democratic Party to question its political orientation, to move away from the kind of um, centrist economic liberalism that was brought about by Bill Clinton, um, continued in some ways by Obama, uh, and to turn more towards those issues of uh, wealth inequality, or whether you know it's going to go back to uh, business as usual. Uh, because changing the platform would also entail, um, I mean, ideally, would also entail changing the way that politics are made. And I'm thinking especially of campaign finance reform. And the problem with campaign finance is that uh, it's like the Electoral College. It's something that Americans talk a lot about every four years when there's an election. When there's an election, you have a lot of hoo-ha about how you know the financing is corrupt and blah 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 and Citizens United and it's a shame and etc. Same thing about the Electoral College, it has to be changed because it's unfair. And then you know the ones who won took advantage of that system so are not particularly adamant on changing it and the ones who lost are too busy either crying or trying to rebuild something uh, to care about it. Uh, so to me this issue of campaign finance reform uh, might seem anecdotal but it's actually central to the way that politics in the US work. Uh, and the problem is that the problem is not whether you rely on Wall Street or on the Silicon Valley to fund your campaign. The problem is that you, you have to rely on those big donors because you can't campaign unless you have a billion dollars. Um, so we're going to have to see who emerges from the ashes of this election in the Democratic Party and how they build their platform. Uh, whether, basically, whether the progressives within the Democratic Party are going to uh, manage to impose a new orientation. Uh, but politics being always a game of reaction, this, was, this will also depend on uh, what Trump does during his presidency. And surprisingly enough for some of his supporters, Sanders said that he was willing to work with Trump on some of his projects, for instance, uh, the funding of infrastructure projects uh, all through America. But I mean, Bernie Sanders is a politician. Um, so that, once again, I mean, I don't find it particularly shocking that he should say that because in a spirit of partisanship, if you see something that the other side does, which seems right to you, you approve it. And the problem being, you know, do you approve of funding infrastructure if the same government that is asking that is also deporting millions of illegal immigrants. Can you separate uh, the various issues in the support that you give to such an administration? And that's an entirely different question. And the question also, the, the mobilization of the young people. You know, where will it go? Where will all that energy go? Um, the people who um, organized and campaigned for Obama in 2008, well, we saw a lot of them in uh, on Occupy Wall Street three years later. I think it's about something like 80% of occupiers had campaigned for Obama in 2008. And that's also interesting. The fact that the presidency of Barack Obama, of course, sparked opposition and social movements on the right, the Tea Party being the most important, uh, but also on the left whether you think, you think of OWS or of Black Lives Matter. Okay. I have one question. Um, regarding the letter to the next left, I was wondering 
how can the working class be reached through these magazines and how can revolutionary ideas trickle up into mainstream when uh, people are deliberately or not being kept uninformed and don't really care about or even despise <coughs> academia. And to me, the, the, this new buzzword, post-factual age, comes to mind. And so I'm not saying that the radical left should become a populist movement, and I enjoy reading the Jacobin, and I think it's important what they do, but don't you think that uh, the masses or the working class should be reached through means outside academic um, magazines, or perhaps that um, radical ideas should be made more easily accessible intellectually? Um, yes, that's always the problem when you speak about uh, leftist magazines, is basically the only people who read them are leftists and professors and activists and, I mean, that's, that's the reality of it. Um, however, there are several things. One of them, uh, which I believe is, um, in spite of what Jacobin sometimes say, uh, still very embryonic, is the question of the link with social movements. Okay? If you manage to make that link, especially through, so unions in the US today are very weak. They are also in Europe, but in the US they are very weak. So it's difficult to imagine today a mass movement of unionization and organization of workers. However, the fight for $15 has, so the fight for $15 is not a revolutionary movement. Okay? They have very clear goals. Uh, that they want to achieve, and they have managed to achieve them in a number of places. A number of states have accepted to raise the minimum wage over the next few years. The right to a union is sometimes more difficult to negotiate than a raise in the minimum wage. Um, so to me, I think one of those intermediaries can be the unions. However, um, although you know the, the writers and editors at those magazines criticize academia and, and, you know, and, and are not necessarily in it. Uh, that's the big difference with the generation that preceded them. Uh, however, they still come from the same milieu and they're still in that form of intellectual circle that doesn't really permeate uh, into social movements, let's say beyond New York okay, or beyond uh, Chicago. Um, the other problem is that the United States is a really big country. Uh, and so in order to when you look at social movements over the past few years, there have been important social movements uh, in the US, which have sometimes failed, but sometimes, like the fight for $15, obtained things. Um, however, they don't coalesce, but that is the same problem that we have uh, in Europe. And that's what those magazines are trying to do, is also to try to um, cross the various movements. Um, at an intellectual level, it's not, I mean, I believe in the power of ideas, but it's very slow, uh, it doesn't always work, it very seldom works. Um, and I think that the double strategy uh, of reaching towards social movements on the one hand, and also towards the mainstream on the other, is the probably the best possible way. And then in terms of translation, I agree with you. Um, there's always the problem of, but that's, I mean, that's a very generic issue, but how do you translate your ideas um, for an audience who doesn't particularly care about ideas or it has other more material preoccupations, like, you know, uh, how do I feed my kids at the end of the month? Um, <laughs> and, and it is through the intermediaries that are uh, unions or, teachers, uh, professors, etc., etc., that that can uh, percolate. Um, however, I do realize the, um, not necessarily the insufficiency, but um, yes, the limits of that position, uh, because it comes from both ends. I mean, I don't believe in an intellectual avant-garde who would lead the people on towards social change, okay? It, it goes both ways. Uh, ideally, each nourishes the other. Uh, but the problem for that is that you have to build bridges. And this is also a problem in terms of uh, personnel, in terms of who writes for you. Uh, I know that when I worked for Esprit, uh, 
we had this problem. We said, well, we want to diversify the authors who write for us because we have too many academics. And we would like to have um, social workers and, and, I don't know, doctors and judges, etc., etc., because their point of view on you know, French society today is valuable. Uh, but then we had a problem, which was, we are a small magazine, we don't have a lot of money, we can't pay our authors. Or if we pay them, we pay them really, really little. And, you know, academics can do that, because they're paid. Anyway, and they're paid to write, um, and other people can't. Either because they don't have the time, or because um, they don't like to write, they don't want to write, or because they need money, and they won't write if you can't pay them money. So that's, there are uh, infrastructural problems to this issue of how do you bridge the gap. Actually, I want to comment and follow up on this. Uh, I think if you have this situation uh, where you have uh, academia crew, graduate students, people doing PhD, publishing radical left magazine, maybe one strategy is like giving up altogether, organizing what's traditionally called working class, but you organize people in your own field. So like students, cultural workers, journalists, NGO workers, all those that uh, consider themselves very progressive but uh, are experiencing different uh, problems in their own production. And the other thing is uh, what you mentioned now is the question of fu public funding. And actually now I remember that I never noticed in any of these uh, magazines talking about this specific issue about public funding of media or involving in a wider movement, for example, this media reform movement that Free Press is doing. And maybe this is because this is a completely different tradition. They simply don't have and they never had uh, public funding for media. But I think this could be a way uh, to, be, to be able to include in your media production people who are coming from other spheres or from different class positions. Yeah, so by the first thing, as I said, uh, uh, a number of these people are involved in the unionization of graduate students, for instance. Um, to protest against the conditions of uh, non-tenured faculty in the United States, um, which is pretty dire today, especially in the humanities and the social sciences, where basically you have grad students living under the poverty line uh, because of the you know, miserable salaries that they're paid. But it's, once again, not only the case in the US. Um, as for subsidies, yes, it's a very different uh, system in the US. Uh, the media are not I mean, you have, um, it's complicated because even what is called uh, public media, so basically you have NPR, the National Public Radio, and PBS, <clears throat> the TV channel, uh, are actually mostly privately funded. Uh, there's a small um, uh, participation from the government, but it's mostly through uh, donations and fundraising, etc., etc. And the press in the United States is not. So they have tax advantages, etc., but there, they, there aren't as is the case in Croatia, as is the case in France at least, uh, subsidies from the government. So that's an issue that doesn't come up simply because mm -hmm. it's not the way it works. And that is also why um, donations and fundraising and events, I didn't uh, speak about that, but uh, those magazines obviously also organize a lot of events, some events that are more geared towards um, you know, spreading the good word, uh, some events which are much more geared towards getting some money. Uh, in order for the magazine to uh, to function. And that is something that you find also probably the, well, not the main difference, but one of the big differences between the US and Europe uh, in, in that respect is the, the way that the culture industry also works in the US uh, that is not directly funded by the government. It's indirectly funded through uh, tax deduction and tax exemption. Uh, but it's not, there's no Ministry of Culture in the US, uh, as there is, for instance, in France. There's no national uh, cultural policy. And, um, and artists themselves, in their majority, do not want one. But you know, that would be going too far into America's cultural history to explain why it is. But at any rate, this issue of government funding is not uh, on the table. I don't even know whether some of them ask for it. I shouldn't think so. And especially not now, they would 
Philip, do you have information about profit trends in those left margins? Profit trends? Yes. There are none. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, mostly, uh, I don't have the specific figures, to be honest with you. Um, but most of these magazines, and you know, if, if I take my experience in French magazines, it's, it's mostly you're in the red or you're just breaking even. Um, you very rarely, and, and also in terms of personnel, you have to realize that uh, in a lot of those teams, uh, there are only uh, one or two people who are actually paid, and mostly that's the technical professions, okay? So the designers, the accountants, etc., etc. The people who write and edit um, are sometimes paid, sometimes not, and get their revenue from so, elsewhere. So motive is honest, right? I'm sorry? Motive is honest. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, there's no, if you want to make money, don't do that. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, you, you talked about media that are web-based and, and uh, in, in paper, and uh, why, why is paper version, is it still important? Why, why do they do that? Yes, so it's very important. Um, it's very important because, first of all, for many magazines, especially the little magazines, it is still what brings in money, mm -hmm. paper subscriptions, um, okay? Uh, because a lot of the online content is free. Uh, those are websites that do not have advertising, for the most part. Um, they advertise, you know, for publications by the New Left Press or Verso or whatever, but uh, they have very little advertising. So the, um, the paper magazine is important, first of all, in terms of economic model, for some of them. Uh, also because uh, there is, there still is, whether it's uh, accurate or not, this idea of something that last something that you can manipulate, something that you can pass on, have someone read, which is also the case with online content. content. Uh, and also this desire, and that's, it's interesting that to me, this deliberately by media strategy, which I think is fueled by economic purposes, as I said, uh, but also by a desire for a complementarity between the two. That is, the, you don't, you don't read in the same way on a website as when you have a paper copy. And I'm thinking of uh, not only Jacobin, also N plus one, etc. The idea is that each issue um, has its internal coherence and consistency. And therefore, it's not the same thing when you read one article online and when you have the whole issue in your hands. And that is something uh, that counts when you are making the magazine. Uh, and, and when I worked at Esprit, it's true that when you think about your issue, you think about it as an issue. Uh, which article are you going to put first? Uh, how are you going to uh, frame your introduction? Um, if you're going to have transition or you know, uh, photographs or, or um, uh, drawings or whatever, uh, that enters into the whole object. And that is something that you don't have on the internet because you're going to not necessarily read uh, the articles as a whole. You're going to take what you're interested in. And I think that for, for people who make magazines, it's very important that this intention of consistency <coughs> remain. And to me at least, I believe that it can only be embodied in paper. But what is interesting is that they're very innovative, very. Um, for, for leftists and, and you know, <laughs> Sorry, I'm not saying that leftists are not innovative in terms of form. That would be very, very wrong. Uh, but they deliberately think in terms of design. What I mean is it, it's not necessarily been a priority of political magazines up to now, how they presented themselves. Um, and, and therefore, they try also to have very different formats online and uh, on paper um, to enable that kind of complementarity to bring people to the magazine through the website and then ideally to end up with uh, a paper subscription.